928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extend the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Stumbling down the road with Bridget Lynn Dolgoff as she carries stones, digs holes, and wheels her shovels on her way. This road is the real path. It is never easy and never clear, but always entertaining. This journey has not been a seated event as Bridget walks, runs, stumbles, carries, digs, drags, laughs, fights, sings, prays, dances, kicks, screams, and oftentimes falls. Hello. Hello. Hold on one second. I'm going to open. Hey, everybody. It's, uh, yes, you are listening to Revolution Radio, uh, freedomslips.com. We are the oldest uh, radio station on the net. Um, And uh, I am Bridget Lynn Dolgoff, your host. And my show is Caring Stones and Digging Holes, radio show on Revolution Radio. Hey, we are 100% listener supported. Um, everything that everybody does on this network, we volunteer our time, um, and we require, you know, minimum amounts to keep everything rolling. Uh, so please go to our funding page, that's Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and look at all the amazing ways that you can fund our network, including advertising, and that's how I support our network, is I advertise my um, online healthcare business. And healthcare works. So you can do that. We also have, you know, heirloom seed packages. Um, uh, or you can just, you know, if you want to toss us a few bucks, you can do that as well. Anyway, so today I have a new person on the show, uh, which I'm excited about. And I have to be honest, um, I, I overheard the person for about 20 minutes on a show. And I can't tell you exactly what the show was. And I was really kind of interesting and I guess aligned um, with some of, uh, what he was discussing. And so I reached out to him and, and he agreed to come on the show. So I have him on the show. So I don't know a lot about Robert. So we're going to actually find out about him today, um, and, uh, his work. So it's Robert Stanley, uh, R O B E R T and Stanley. I hope I'm saying that right. S T A N L E Y. So in case people want to look him up, they can find him. And, and, and Robert, do you have a website where people can um, start tapping into the conversation where they can go and actually take a look? Yes, Bridget. Uh, it is unicusmagazine.com. It's spelled U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. Yeah, and you guys can go there, look it up while we're, we're chatting away today. Um, a lot of interesting information on that site. I actually, I actually downloaded two PF. PDFs off of it today. <laughs> so <laughs> I was very excited. Um, okay, so uh, one of the PDFs I noticed that you guys had on the front page of your website is, is a, 
um, an amazing book, um, mm-hmm. and it's the Return of the Bird Clans. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I'm interested in that um, because I have a lot of friends that are native that I've studied under and learned from, yeah. but also I've been having my own. Um, you know, experiences, uh, I think it was in 2016 where a bird, humanoid, higher evolved being, you know, visited me. Oh, wow. So, I know that they're returning. You know, I'm not really sure about the whole blue avion thing. Those are not the kind of... No. A lot of the mainstream beings, I don't see those beings. (laughs) I don't even know who they are. I see, like, a whole bunch of other kind of stuff. So... Um, which doesn't make anybody right or wrong. <laughs> you know, everybody has their own experience. I'm just saying. So, Robert, usually what I do when I have people on my show, and I know that you probably have to go over this over and over again every time you're on radio, but you can, um, the only thing that you can't say on the word, the network is F, F word. But oh. everything goes. So you can talk <laughs> about, you can go as deep as you want. You can talk about, you know, a lot of the people that come on my show talk more extreme when they're on my show than normal. So, um, and extreme, I mean, you know, deep information. So we're pretty conscious here. So Good. could you give us a little bit of a um, background? You can go on as long as you want, kind of like, you know, where you popped out and then how you've gotten to here so that we kind of have an idea about what the conversation is going to lead to today. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I came into this world in 1959 in Topanga Canyon, California. That's where my parents were living when I touched down <laughs> this particular incarnation. So I was fortunate, I think. Uh, I chose well. Um, got to travel around. I've been to 59 countries in 59 years so far. Um, it's been quite an amazing adventure. But as I said, I was born and raised in the Malibu area. It's changed quite a bit. And um, I had no idea that it was, it's, it's so beautiful on the surface, but, you know, it, it has a very dark undercurrent. Um, a lot of really negative stuff has gone on there with um, genocide. I mean, first of all, there, there was what I found out that there was a, um, prior to the so-called Native American people, what they called it, the Shumash, um, there was another group of people that lived there. I guess we just call them Lemurians. And they were wiped out in a flood, according to some of the Shumash elders that I met over the course of my life and shared information and artifacts with them that I'd found. A lot of it seemed very accidental, but, you know, in retrospect, I'm sure that I've been guided like the rest of us. You know, we all have our guides and uh, life lessons that we need to learn. Some of them are more difficult than others. And so part of the process for me, the awakening process, started in 1985. And um, I had saved a young boy's life there when I was working as a security guard at the beach. And in the process of doing that, I actually became aware of these parasitic thought forms. Some people call them archons or demons or whatever. Uh, It turns out (laughs) that they're very real but they're not as powerful as some people think. And um, so that was a, it was a shocking, to say the least, to find out that um, the, the world is such a, a more, more interesting place than we've been led to believe currently. Our, our system of education is really lacking, I think, in a lot of ways. And that's changing. But back in 1985, things were pretty... Um, constrained. It, it's like, yeah, there was a spiritual, metaphysical, whatever, but it was not nearly as um, prevalent. People were not aware so much of things like um, the dark side, I guess, of the force was not something that that most people were fully aware of, uh, or I should say the reality uh, of a dark side. And um, so as that was happening, I also started to have a lot of close encounters with UFOs. In Malibu, and uh, specifically right there at uh, the naval base at Point Magoo, and that's um, that's one of the reasons I ended up going into this field, because actually I was I felt that they were studying me or following me around for reasons that I just couldn't quite understand, so I 
I set out to uh, try and understand it. And in the process, I realized that there's a lot of people have different pieces of the puzzle. But um, so I, I started reaching out to them, trying to share what I'd learned, and I wanted to know what they thought. And and uh, that's that's ultimately how I got involved as being uh, the editor of Unicus Magazine, which was in print. It was on newsstands for I think 1990 to 1995, something like that. And, and then obviously we transitioned over to the digital realm at some point. And that which was good because then I actually could communicate with people around the planet in a much more seamless way. I mean, we already had subscribers out of the country when we were just in print. But, you know, the old... <laughs> school style of communication you know actual letters writing letters um you know even email is kind of slow compared to like what we're doing now it's it's we can reach people all over the planet so it's it's an amazing time to be alive i know that um it looks bad sometimes if you if you just watch the news or uh even some of these uh, channels on the internet um, they seem to be focused on the problem rather than a solution. And um, I know this is going to sound overly simplistic, but um, the the solution is love. And w- w- unfortunately, right now, um, w- there's a lack of love on this planet. And that's why we are still um, hurting each other and the, the environment. And ultimately why we're not getting off this planet. We're not going to be able to um, colonize other worlds or actually have some relations with other intelligent life forms off this world until we become civilized. In other words, until we raise our love quotient in our hearts individually and collectively. And that's that's something that I've only learned recently. Um, I, I have put those books up. I think that are very, very instructional books at my homepage at unicusmagazine.com. They're free. And I suggest anybody who's interested in um, participating in a very positive and loving and prosperous future that, you, you know, you read some of the books and the information that I posted there. Awesome. So um, have you had, I mean, have you, have you had direct experiences with um, extraterrestrials or non? Um, every you know all the different people that are in this field call it something different. I had um, Ray Hernandez on, who's mm-hmm. with the. You probably know who he is, right? Um, yeah. And he calls them non-human intelligence. That's kind of like <laughs> what what they what they call them. So um, you know, but everybody has kind of a different, I guess, vocabulary for those beings have you had um experiences directly with a hologram i guess a lot of them come in a holographic image sometimes but that you want to share with people Uh, i have met people that claim to be from off this world they look completely human to me Um, you know and the craft appear to be very much three-dimensional as well um however there are other beings that are not physical. You, you can call them holographic if you want, but um, they are, I mean, we're all multidimensional beings anyway. And, and ultimately, the physical world that we think of as being solid isn't, which makes things very interesting when you start getting into stuff like uh, remote viewing and out-of-body experiences. Um, I have photographed UFOs a few times in my life Um, and I know that they are monitoring us I don't even like that term UFO because they clearly have an identity Um, it's just that we're not really as I said officially they don't even exist it's it's starting to shift now but this whole concept of disclosure I think is a bit silly because that's not what we're looking for it's not about the government finally admitting that they've been lying to us. It's <laughs> disclosing that we have extended family throughout all of creation. 
and it's about reestablishing that relationship in a very loving and peaceful way. That's the only way forward. And clearly the government as it stands, and I don't mean just the U.S., all the governments on this planet are uncivilized and dangerous. And um, it's this is one of the difficulties for benevolent beings, the rest of our family, to come here and interact with us is, um, uh, I mean, it's probably the same reason why most people don't go to a prison and interact with inmates. You know, it's it, it's just not a pleasant thing to do, and it is dangerous, and there are restrictions on the amount of interaction that, that can go on. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I totally agree 100%. And I also, you know, have a lot of experience with the other forces as well through the whole my life. And I think you had, you had a father that was kind of involved in this kind of work too. My dad um, was chased around by the government. You know, they were trying to capture him to put him in remote viewing programs and kind of use wow. him as a weapon. And they they handled my mom too before she met my um, dad. And uh, they, you know, fried her cookies because she comes from an old bloodline, too. They fried her cookies in a, a mental hospital for four months. You know, they sent this guy that, you know, was exceptional, seemed exceptional to my family and supposedly fell in love with my mom. They got married right out of high school. And he handled her all the way back to the East Coast away from her family and then put her in a mental hospital. So, wow. yeah, so I have kind of a long history with, you know you know, kind of all these, um, energies and realities and, um, whatever, you know, you bump up against in this world. Um, yeah, but I was I, visited I, the other day. I'll just tell you this. By what? Oh, by, um, representatives from what I call my star family. Uh, and, um, yeah, they, uh, we had a huge fight for a long period of time since 2014. <laughs> so, okay. so finally, you know, I started, opening the door back up to them, trying to set some boundaries. And, um, and then, so finally they're visiting me again. So they came in a, like a, you know, metallic ship and they were, it was in the morning and I was out collecting herbal medicine and I saw this uh, beautiful butterfly kind of finishing hatching mm -hmm. and it, because of the direction that I was looking at, you know, because it all happens so that you'll pay attention, right? They know what you're going to stop at, what you're going to pay attention to. Yeah. And then so I saw this flashing in the sky and I looked up and they were like leaning towards the sun and mm -hmm. then back, you know, kind of like sending me a message. I said, well, I don't understand SOS, but I asked them, you know, the typical question. So I was kind of excited to actually see them here mm -hmm. because they haven't come into here before. They've stayed out. So the fact that they're sending scouts out, right, yeah. um, is a big deal. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's definitely Currently. a huge, huge shift that's that's taking place. You know, this thing about disclosure, as I said, is a bit silly. But what's happening is that um, they don't know how to tell the truth. These the ones that so called leaders, in positions of power here on this planet, um, they don't. Because then uh, it's a very uncomfortable truth to admit that we are uncivilized and that the only way that we can have a relationship is through disarmament and and um, initiating a we, we here's the thing we can initiate global peace, but until we do, um, basically this world is off limits. As far as as far as them having direct relations with us and being able to assist us openly, it isn't it can't happen, you know. So the government, in its current form, is based on um, corruption and cruelty and uh, destruction. Essentially, you know, the for example, um, the the global finance system right now is is totally broke. There is more debt than there is assets. At least on the books, it's like 248 trillion is what the numbers been keeps popping up. Most people don't pay attention to it. I'm not an economist, but I can tell you right now that um, if the entire planet is broke under the current system, then we need a new system. And um, 
the pe- the problem is the people that consider themselves to be the rulers of this world are standing in the way of a reset. The, the thing is, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if we wanted to go down the path of peace and prosperity and we start to disarm ourselves um, because we're starting to embrace the love quotient and and more importantly to to release ourselves from the lie of all the negativity that there that somehow there's a threat there's an extraterrestrial threat um, once we get past that then they will be able to the, the benevolent ones will be able to help us take the, the next steps towards um, rehabilitating the planet reconstituting all the life support systems that have been so badly damaged here, um, cleaning up our mess, essentially, and helping us coordinate a much better future for everyone, including, I'm talking about all life forms. Um, And then ultimately being able to um, move off world, if some of us choose to do that, but we're not going to be allowed to to take military weapons into space and do what some people think, like Star Trek or Star Wars or something like that. That's why I sent you that little piece from the yesterday. It's pretty obvious to me that um, um, we have an incredible potential, but that w- you know, it's not like somebody's just going to hand it to us. We have there's thing there's certain key things that we need to do first. In order to achieve the the uh, a better future for everybody, and it's going to be difficult. I know that, but we have a lot of help, and it's important to ask for help from these other beings because, as I said before, we're all family. That's why they care. That's why they watch us. That's why they do their best to assist us within the boundaries that they, that are currently existing. Yeah, I always, just a couple of things to add in there, but, um, you know, disclosure, I always laugh at disclosure. It's like, since I came to this planet, um, I've been disclosed to, you know, (laughs) and (laughs) I wonder, you know, I always think about like how many other millions of people have always already had disclosure, have been disclosed, Mm. you know, so this whole term like, oh, they're going to disclose it's like (laughs) ludicrous because most, just listen to the people who've had experiences, you know, and you'll know exactly what's going on and what the truth is. And some Mm. experiences are good and some are bad, you know, but that's our world. We live in a polarity and a duality. Well, okay, look, since you brought that up, I know what you're talking about. There, The current narrative amongst a lot of people in the so-called alternative talk community is that um, there's evil extraterrestrials running around and, and somehow um, abusing us. And um, I, at this point, I don't agree with that at all. I've come to understand that, um, again, a lot of this came from those three free books that you can read at my top of the page of my website at unicusmagazine.com. It's, uh, it's, I know it's written as children's books, but in fact it is contact. It's based on contact that the author had in California in August of 1985. My contacts really started in September of 1985, also on the coast of California. So I recognize the validity of what is being said in those books. What is presented as fiction is based on fact. And the fact is that um, we create our own problems. There is no external threat. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a dark side. And here's where it gets really interesting. I've come to understand the purpose of the dark side. And it was actually put in place by the creator. And it is so, so like a circuit breaker in an uh, electrical system. If the system overloads, gets too hot, it shuts down. The same is true for every world throughout creation. When the the negativity gets too great, let me put it a different way, when the science and intellect is greater than the love and the spirituality, that system will collapse. It's 
to be more specific, it's like, okay, so for me, if I am fearful and angry and and my heart is full of that kind of energy, a dissonant energy, then those entities, those thought forms, the dark side, will have a place to dwell in my heart. And they will encourage me to go down that path because it sustains them. It's a very simple program. They are a very, very, very simplistic program, but they serve a very, very important service because you got to understand that if a world was allowed to for its science to to go um, develop without any spiritual balance, then it would ultimately go off and spread across the all the other worlds like an infection, and ultimately all of creation would be at risk. So it's actually a very intelligent and benign system that has been set up. And the reason I'm telling you this is because all, all, all these stories about like Anunnaki coming here and, and doing whatever, it, it just isn't accurate. I've always felt kind of funny about that whole thing, like there was something wrong with it. So the, so the question is, where does this all come from? Well, there was a prior civilization. It was called Atlantis. And they did a lot of incredibly ugly things with uh, genetic experimentation, hybrids, uh, technologies that we consider to be advanced to this day. They had all of that, and it collapsed because of their lack of uh, spirituality and love. I equate those two things as one and the same, okay? Spirituality and love. And um, prior to that was Lemuria. And obviously they had problems as well, ultimately. It fell. So when you look at the, the, these, these so-called historical documents or records, uh, and they are very much interpreted through people like Zachary Sitchin and others, um, they want us, or they, some, somehow people have want to believe <laughs> That they're in, that there's some like we're victims of these otherworldly beings. When in fact, it's all homegrown. The the negative ones are here. We're part of the problem. Every time we we agree to believe and participate in negativity, um, it becomes real. It is our reality, and that's what we've created here, to some degree. There's it. It's not all of it, okay? There's a lot of beautiful things about this planet, no doubt. And we have received a lot of help, or it would have been a lot worse. Um, but we are at a very important crossroads here. We have to decide which direction we want to go. Um, otherwise, it will collapse again. I think that's what, what happened at uh, actually out at the Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest earthquakes recently at China Lake the Naval Weapons Testing Center, I believe that they actually triggered those earthquakes and, and destroyed their own facility to some extent. Yep. Um, I was just kind of thinking about, you know, um, just different kinds of aspects of my life, kind of, you know, visualizing things popping up in my head while you were, while you were um, talking. Mm-hmm. And um, there was just a, a conversation that, for some reason, my mind just totally went to from um, a client of mine who was a reptoid hybrid. Mm -hmm. And like a really high, you know, ranking person um, in international research. And uh, I remember having after, you know, he was done seeing me, you know, um, me working on him, helping him fix his body. Um, he, we actually sat down and we had a conversation. And the thing that I always took from him was that, you know, he wasn't growly or snarly or, you know, anything like this. He was going to have a, you know, conversation and kind of a matter of fact conversation that didn't have a lot of emotional stuff, you know, surrounding it, not positive, negative. Um, and I remember him telling me about why, you know, kind of from their perspective, you know, what's kind of going on with the planet. Mm -hmm. And because they also live here 
and they also have needs. Well, you know, this was a reptilian planet to begin with, right? (laughs) Exactly. And so, he said, you know, we don't do this to humans on purpose. I mean, the problem is, is that humans need alkalinity and we need acid. Uh So, we need chemicals in the environment and in the Uh water and and in the food and, you know, all these kinds of things. And he said, you know, it's, it will probably end up destroying the planet because he said, that's what we do. We, we go from planet to planet and, you know, it's just because of what we need in order to survive that, that just basic stuff, you know, usually damages these types of planets. Well, if, if that's the case and they came here, um, they, they would have had to been benevolent to begin with when they got here and ultimately once again that's an example of their science was not balanced with their spirituality and ultimately they collapsed the planet to a point where a lot of them died you know and a new group came in but obviously there's enough of them still here they still consider it to be their world or want to inhabit this world as well for some reason but this level of competition that we currently see here on this world does not exist throughout all of the creation. So oh, I yeah, you, I totally agree with that. Yeah, but it's, okay, look, I'm glad we can talk about it, but, you know, you got to understand that there are people in this f- so-called field of U- UFOs, <laughs> alternative talk, uh, what do you call it, new age, metaphysical, I don't know. Um, I think all those terms are kind of misleading, but... I think, too, exactly. That's why I liked you, because you kind of had when it got down deep and you were talking about things, we had a very similar perspective or, you Mm. know, like I've had a lot of experience, like I've gone, I work on people, I do Mm. healing type work. And one of the things, sometimes they send me back to where their original planet was and I can see what the planet was like. I don't get involved with the name of the planet or what universe it is. Um, I go to the information that they want me to know, you know what I mean? What I need to glean off the situation, but I've seen um, I've seen some some beautiful cooperative planets, and I've seen people that were um, sold basically from their planet for to take off world because they couldn't get along in their communities. You know, they couldn't do their yeah. part, and they couldn't yeah. participate. And they're they're even the, it was the most beautiful world, but they had to send them away. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some of that going on. And but yeah. that's not it's not evil. That is to protect the communities that are peaceful and loving. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree with that. So yeah. I, I've seen some beautiful worlds, and I've seen some really interesting things that different people, energies that have been harvested. Also, some planets people lived like as energies. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like undulating type energies, and they communicated with each other, and and just how and and that translated into. I worked on a lady a while back who. That's why she has such a hard time being here. And the other oh, problem yeah. was that she was harvested from there to operate a bio suit. You know, a battery for a bio suit, and came here. Hmm. So it's interesting to see, but. Most of the places that I've gone to, other than here, are amazing. And the experiences I've had with, I call it, I don't call it love, I call it oneness. Okay. Because when there's oneness, there's no edges, you know what I mean? There's no separation. And then you can undulate kind of in all the information, right, that exists and and participate. So, I just kind of have just, oneness kind of suits me better. Yeah, the unfortunately, the word love is badly misunderstood and overly used for the wrong. To to, to for, I think it's you know it's uh, yeah used well, for people, the wrong reasons. Yeah, people start yelling at you and they'll go, "I love you, but <laughs> you're like, uh, no, you don't love me because there's a but." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's, yeah. It's a very confusing time. I know. The thing is, the people here who are still very much. Um, lacking love in their hearts are fearful to put it bluntly and um specifically they they know things are changing and it's sort of like the battered wife syndrome you know she she'll defend her husband even though he's he's hurting her and she'll go back to him even though she's she's being abused um there is some of that we see yeah. it in prison systems too, you know, like where people that have been institutionalized for far too long when they come out, they cannot deal with it. 
they feel uncomfortable outside of the prisons and they want to get back in. So there are some here that are, are still suffering. They don't want, they're not ready to move into the light and really embrace that love or oneness as you talk about. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I have this conversation with some pretty, you know, brilliant people, like out of the box immunologists, because we talk a lot about what's happened to the DNA mm -hmm. and all of that, because when you have generations, um, you know, 10, 15, 100 generations that everything is war and conflict and stress, that that, you know, just also becomes part of your code mm -hmm. and that it's a really hard thing to actually break um, to be able to heal that DNA and that code. Um, so sometimes I look at it like, you know, what's in the code as well. Um, what's in people's codes and whether they have ability to learn how to love or be part of um, oneness. Um, and, you know, the other thing too is like peace is a, like love. It's a really misused word and, and not to offend people out there. <laughs> but um, I remember thinking, you know, Gandhi is this really great guy. Like he, you know, used his body and starved his body, you know, to try to help create peace and, and, and help the people in the best way. And, but then I was reading about him and, and I understand that this was like a mindset during, you know, his time frame. but he refused his wife, any kind of treatment for her cancer. Wow. And he let her die, a really horrible, painful death. And I, I got that, you know, she was given to him, you know what I mean, in his culture as a, as a bride. Mm -hmm. So she was kind of sold wow. to him. So he would have had this kind of mindset. But I was like, okay, so right there, that's violence <laughs> against women, not mm -hmm. allowing your wife to even be looked at by a doctor, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, and having that, any kind just, of treatment. So he, peace, and, he, he wasn't really initiating peace. He was no. initiating more violence. Yeah, and, and a lot of us, look, they say the unintended consequences. The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We, we unfortunately, are uncivilized. That was, you're, you're describing someone who, even though he's on some level, he's, a, he's working towards being peaceful and loving, that doesn't mean there isn't any negativity, fear, and, you know, cruelty in his heart. And th this is the problem. One here, we looked for leadership and guidance from our, from our fellow man, but this is, that's not going to be much help because it's like the blind leading the blind. And this is why I do think it's important to read books like Return of the Bird Tribe because it gives you a new perspective, or even the other books that I have at the the this, the children's books, AMI, the Friendly Extraterrestrial, it's spelled AMI, AMI, okay, for, short for Amigo. But it, it's, it's <laughs> you know, the, the truth is so much simpler than all this nonsense, all the lies that are being told here on this planet. And um, it's really, it is just a process of healing our hearts and souls. I know that sounds utterly simplistic, but it's true. And um, it's not that easy. It isn't, especially if you've been here for many lifetimes. It's it's a it, what happens is it's not just a code. It's a resonant, excuse me. It's a pattern. It's an energy pattern that is dissonant. And the stronger the dissonant energy or dark energy that we embrace or embody, it it makes it much harder to transmute over to tune into the resonant energy and embrace it and embody it because that's that there's a stark difference between those two things yeah well another thing too i get in these conversations with a lot of people and about language how language yep. is being used um because i love jordan maxwell i have him on periodically mm -hmm. and um we were talking the last time about how every you know, system has its own dictionary and you get the Merriam dictionary <laughs> and what that word means in your dictionary and what it means in medicine or what it means in law or what it means here is completely and totally different. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, we have to really kind of start with, you know, um, defining our own personal language, you know, that, that 
makes us feel good about um, who we are and what we are and um, and a lot of different things I think work for different people. I, you know, I, um, one of my favorite, you know, statements about personal, like you were talking about how we kind of let the outside world reflect on us more than us reflecting on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, because we take it personally, you know, I always in American culture, when I'm working with people, I always bump up with a lot of the, um, you know, I'm not good enough. You know, these events have happened to me through this life and, and, um, this is who I am, um, and into kind of a, a victimization. But I love what Miguel Ruiz in his very simple book, The Four Agreements said, you know, don't take anything personally. Mm -hmm. That it, even if somebody shot you in your head, it wasn't personal. It wasn't about you. It was about them all the time. Well, yeah, because they're stuck in dissonance and mm -hmm. they want to project that onto you and everybody else. Yep. Yep. So this is this is what I was trying to say before. This is a huge distinction. Uh, people that are consider themselves to be victims are hanging on, clinging to dissonance, and it's a dead end by design. It's an insurance policy to make sure that. You know, it, the infection, that particular thought, patterning, that frequency doesn't spread throughout creation. It's yeah. an interesting concept. I didn't ever know this. I've been struggling with this for decades trying to figure out what is, what, what is the purpose. And it turns out it's a very powerful purpose. And it was in this little children's book, very obscure book, as far as I could tell. I never... I, would, I think I would have heard about it sooner, but it just kind of popped up on my radar. So I've been sharing it with people because the insights are extremely powerful and liberating. Yeah, I kind of have moved through the door the last two years with the, um, because of my native teachers, you know, a lot of these entitlement issues that mm -hmm. we have, I think that leads <laughs> down the same doorway. Yeah. You know, like I'm not, because, you know, I'm functioning, I'm not entitled to have a house. I'm not I, and I don't really think that's how everything was set up and arranged anyway, that you would have to wait for somebody to build you a house and then work for it and pay for it and then move into it, right, and then have to pay all this stuff on it. I don't believe that's how this planet and through the teachings that I've gotten, that, that that's how it originally was set up. No, absolutely not. We're, it's okay. It's like a communal, our family uh, life, everything is shared. Everybody is considered important and value has value as part of the family or tribe and the, the, the current system as i said that we're living under is uncivilized it is not about that it's in fact that's why all the tribal people ultimately were crushed i'm not saying they're perfect but that particular system of life has been eradicated from this world for a period of time um and that's, as I say, you know, this the, the entire system that of, of living here is unsustainable. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I know that's going to offend some people, but it, it's, it has to fall apart before we can put together something in its place. Because ultimately, right now, there's an embargo, not just on truth, but, but peace and prosperity and, and happiness and love. You don't see that coming across the airwaves. The governments are, and in other institutions, including religious institutions, even though they, like you said, they, they, they say things like peace and love and whatever, but their actions speak louder than their words. Um, clearly, that's not their goal. They all are very much in competition with one another, arguing over my, my way. It's my way is better than your way. <laughs> not, not um, hey, we all have something in common here. Let's work together. Let's co collaborate. Let's coordinate. Let's show some compassion to each other. Let's you know clean up our mess. Let's ultimately reach out and and um, have peaceful relations with the rest of our family off world, because they're just standing there waiting. You know, well, not they're it's not I, they're they're not just doing nothing. But I'm saying they really want to be reunited with us naturally because we're all family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, um, I was just thinking about um, 
one of the things, you know, that I learned, so I've kind of been pretty much homeless since 2006 in my vehicles, but wow. one of the things that it actually has taught me is about a lot of the entitlement stuff, because I don't really, the kind of person that I am and what I'm interested in and, and the work that I'm doing actually to help this world mm-hmm. doesn't earn an income, you know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't have an income bracket. And so in order for me to be able to do that work, um, you know, I, I really can't afford to put a roof over my head, though I work a lot. But one of the things that it it has freed me from is all of the, the distractions of everything that the system keeps you in on mm-hmm. like a rat on a wheel. And it's really hard to have peaceful moments so you can't really ever feel peace you're never going to have peace or find peace unless you have time to sit and kind of like explore peace you know or have quiet or you know vibe with nature i find nature is is a the co-creation you know it's like a super great teacher um and how it works together um and 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 that it needs each other to work together and it wants us to work with it and so for me, it's like, I can't really be a super peaceful person unless there's stuff that I got rid of in my life. And to other people, it scares them, you know, that I'm homeless or, you know, they feel like this is my choice. I'm, I'm underachieving <laughs> in their world. Mm. But for me, it's probably saved my life. I mean, on a lot of levels, because it's really stopped a lot of thought processes that I that I was in and what freed me to do what I want to do do what I think is best in the right and perfect you know in the best way that I can yeah that's a good point that's a really good point because you bring it up something that's essential for us to move forward and to ultimately heal ourselves and that is to think less and feel more yeah yeah and you know what this is a major thing that it's really also taught me is that my body requires sleep and, you know, for my brain patterning and my brain, both sides of my hemispheres to be in sync and my body to be in sync, I need rest and good rest. That's just mm-hmm. how, how these, you know, vehicles work. And unless people make time to rest more and they'll find that things kind of come more into sync and you may have to go through a period where you, you're, you're resting a lot and you're getting a huge amount of sleep to recover your systems so that you, you know, can step out into a different space mm. in yourself and the world around you. I think rest is a really important component. I think that they keep us so stressed out mm. in the systems that, it, you know, the lack of sleep, your body doesn't regenerate. I mean, your bio suit, you know, once you go into REM around 3 a.m., your body's regenerating itself. So if you don't go into REM or you're not getting enough sleep, you're not regenerating your bio suit. So your bio suit starts to kind of fight against you as well. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of components like peace for ourselves, peace for our bodies. You know what I mean? Creating peace for ourselves, you know, as best we can. And that will help to create peace in the world. So can I ask where are you now? Where am I? I don't know. That's kind of a, a loaded question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what what region of the planet are you on? Oh, I'm in what I call uh, um, the home, the land of the cabal, the international home of the cabal. I live in Nevada, Reno, Nevada. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Well, there's some beautiful mountains up there. Near Tahoe, yeah, right? You know, yeah, and this year, um, I've been waiting, like, since 2004 to get in the type of herbal program that I am. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in April, starting in April, I think it ends in, like, November, but um, I'm taking a wild crafting herbal medicine program. Coming from a place of doing, you know, large-scale soil or large-scale land restoration, and then I went to biodynamic school, studied Rudolf Steiner's work. Oh, nice. And then and then got really into biodynamics and soil and, and composting and regenerating soil. And so mm-hmm. now it's cool because I can learn how to make a lot of these medicines and find them. But I'm also 
really realize how limited some of these plants are. I mean, it's always a conversation when we go out with our teacher or other people who are going to lead us on these walks um, for plant identification in the wild in different places. And, you know, they always start off with the same thing. Like, you know, we have to be e ecologically responsible. And so if there's only three plants there and you want to harvest them, you can't harvest them, you have to leave them, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of a sad thing. Like it's down to three plants. Like this plant should grow wild. It should be prolific. Um, why isn't it doing that? So it's really kind of helped me because my future work, I really want to be able to get land, large scale, mm -hmm large pieces of land and then mm -hmm. I'm going to have three different projects on each land and one is going to be seed it's going to be um, like plants plant medicine and tree seed recovery planting them on the land and so that they all like each other and I'll plant from all over the world I don't really care there's a lot of people that have issues about that but I think mm -hmm. that we have to save and recover everything we can right now yeah um and then, you know, also have like food production and so people can come and learn. And, and also I'm going to do a combat veterans. Um, they'll have a two-year program for eight veterans to reskill them and tool them on, you know, like working with nature and animals in a full-scale biodynamic farm mm. and teach them how to restore things, right? So they can yeah. go either back to their communities uh, in urban settings and you know I've had to kind of do Rudolf Steiner work in an urban setting so I kind of look at you know where could we create positive carbon areas you know to down to kick down the negative carbon which is not good for this world and where could we plant things and how could we plant them and um, you know so yeah I just want to kind of start this ripple of saving you know saving the plants and seeds and, and everything that we can uh, until, you know, we can get it turned around enough that we could get these plants and seeds back in the hands and soil where, you know, they should be. Good. Sounds good. Are you familiar with Wilhelm Reich's work? Wilhelm, William Reich? Yeah. Yeah, with the Oregon stuff. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's a part of it as well. Yeah. You might want to incorporate that into this um, work you're doing. Yeah, well, the, the biodynamics has its full system on how to create positive carbon, which is argon energy through plants and animals. Okay. So yeah, so it's a whole it's a whole system. Okay, good. Um, yeah, that you do, but I mean they're long. You know, it takes a long time to build them, but they put out a lot of carbon and you know microbes out into the environments. You know, past where they're at. I kind of mm -hmm. like think it's kind of like, you know, Paul Stemmett, where he talks about how they can see now from like satellites, um, like mushroom spores that are now leaving our atmosphere to other planets. And in a billion mm. years, they'll probably land there and help to re-terraform planets that have been destroyed kind of a thing. Mm. So I, anyway, I kind of look at a biodynamic farm like that, large, small scale, <laughs> where it's, you know, spitting out into the other environments around it. Um, all this positive microbial stuff so that it can actually fix the soil and the water and the air. Hmm. But anyway, but yeah, so um, I think that, you know, here pretty quick. Um, but anyway, so I'm taking this herbal medicine program and um, I'm just really looking at how phenomenal, you know, some of these plants are and how subtle they are, like extraterrestrial forces uh, to work with you. I mean, animals sometimes can get just near plants mm -hmm. and they can rub on them, lay on them, and they can actually, you know, like cure themselves immediately of certain things um, because they're so kind of wide open and they're a lot more sensitive where, you know, if people start to ingest some of the plant medicines, it can really change them. Like, for example, horsetail is three, supposedly, who knows, it's, um, you know, one of the oldest plants that is left on the planet they call it a dinosaur plant and it's like 300 million years old and this year i've been using it a lot in biodynamics but i've never really ingested it and this year i did all this uh, unbelievable work with it it just it kind of actually shocked me and so i'm almost the tincture's almost ready so i can't wait to download some information from a 300 <laughs> million year old plant where you know mm. right from the ground right where it's living yeah. where it wants to be living and it's wow. living with you know other other beings yeah so that's going to be kind of a trip <laughs> 
can't wait mm. for that. I can't wait to see what, you know, unfolds. But, um, I, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what it has to say and what it has to kind of information that it wants to, you know, download into my systems. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing that we are all, since you put it that way, downloading, we're all connected to a web of light, all things, all living things, actually even inanimate objects, but not as much. The flow of light is not as strong. Oh, hey, it's, Robert. Sorry, ahead. I really hate to. No, that's um, right. Yeah, we have in about one minute at 56 till we're going into a five minute break. So sure. usually I just have my guests mute and then you can just run around and then come back. Right. Um, and so we're headed towards that break now. So everybody will be back. This is Carrying Stones and Digging Holes radio show. My host is uh, Robert Stanley and we will be back after the first minute of the top of the hour. All right. Be back. Thank you. Looking people out there in Revolution Radio, this is Mario. I invite you to join me Thursdays at 6 o'clock for this, that, and the other. It's a show about you, it's a show about me, but ultimately it's a show where we try to have a little bit of fun. We discuss important topics and we do our best to be apolitical. So I invite you, put on your favorite pair of comfy sweats, your smoking jacket, and grab a beverage of your choice and join me Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock for this that in the other on Revolution Radio. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> From the astral realms to the physical plane, the halls of power to the walls of home, the multiverse to the innerverse, all will be haunted by the ghost in the machine. I am Steve Zeraloff, the ghost in the machine. Mondays, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Studio B, exclusively here on revolution.radio. Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It would just was doing not good things. And I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and 
cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm onto something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. Hey, everybody, it's your host, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. Anyway, so um, for those of you you that are my Saturday listeners... And you're not aware that I also am now on Wednesdays on Revolution Radio. Wednesdays at the noon Eastern Standard Time slot till 2 p.m. And I also am bringing, uh, I needed another day because I have so many amazing people, uh, new guests, returning guests, and um, just uh, a lot of things that you know need to be talked about so i ump the ante and i'm on two days a week i'm on wednesdays and saturdays and saturdays from 1 p.m eastern standard time to 3 p.m eastern standard time if you're not listening to this episode live um it's uh carrying stones and digging holes we're in the second hour and also i want to point your attention to our website revolution radio freedomslips.com uh, we are 100% listener supported, and um, we could always use some extra help. So you can go to our funding link and find all kinds of amazing ways to um, help our network. We have advertising. I do advertising on it for my um, online healthcare um, work, and uh, there's also heirloom seeds. You can just donate, um, or you can pay for archives, which is only $6 a month. So those are all the amazing ways that you can um, help our network. Anyway, we're talking to um, my new friend, um, Robert Stanley, <laughs> and uh, I was telling Mona, uh, she's a, a, one of the other hosts, and she loves my shows on Saturday, so she always listens in. Um, and so I was saying, oh, I'm a little nervous talking to Robert because I, I don't really know you that well. And, and, um, and you know, try, you know, um, very interested in you as a person and your work and your experiences. And she's so funny. She said, oh, it sounds like you guys are old friends. I was like, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. So um, anyway, you were, so Robert Stanley, tell us about your website, um, where you um, have your internet plot of land. Yeah, my cyberspace is unicusmagazine.com. It's spelled U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. There's a lot of free information there for people who are interested in these kind of topics. Uh, There's probably a lot of stuff there that you've never seen before. And um, it's not a test. It's not... (laughs) You just, it, I'm just saying, you can you can actually spend a few minutes or a few days or a few years looking at all the information because I've been working on this for um, actively since 1990 is when I first got involved in doing public reporting on these types of issues. And uh, so I do have a, a large amount of um, hopefully beneficial information. And some of it's entertaining, but... Um, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to be of service, and that's why I do this. And you brought up this, this problem issue that I also face, like most of us that have a conscience, is that um, you know just working to make money. It, you know, that's that's a path a lot of people have taken. Uh, I don't feel good doing that, so that's why I volunteer to do stuff like um, this and the the website. Uh, but I, I also have a uh, found that I, I've been working the last few years um, in uh, social compliance. So when, you know, like companies, they hire factories, I'd say, just say like an American company would hire a factory in some other part of the world. And um, what's become the norm now is the auditing of the factory for for their social compliance, meaning are they abusing the workers and the environment or not? And um, this is basically to lower the liability of whatever company you can imagine. 
they all have to hire factory workers. And there's a lot of money to be made there. So, and there's also a huge temptation to cut corners, you know, um, and ultimately th there is corruption and there is abuse. So what my role in this is when, when the auditors go to the factories, um, English is typically not their first language. So when they write these reports, there's a lot of mistakes or simply the grammar doesn't work well for an American client. So what I do is I just correct the reports for the American client. However, and it's a very simple job for me to do, but I, I know that I'm helping to actually um, do something that's beneficial. And um, I'm not trying to get rich doing it, but it, it definitely helps pay the bills. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Yeah, well, I wondered why you were in the part of the world that you were in. I had to look at your picture like several times. Yeah. After I saw, you know, where your location is. Um, well, I, I was in Hong Kong, and that's but that's not. Look, my wife was the one that actually worked in the toy industry, and that's how we ended up in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. And that, but that's where I found that job. Yeah. You know, which is it was really strange. It was literally like a needle in a haystack. Most of the job positions there, they want you to speak at least two languages fluently and write them. And um, I'm only good at one, and <laughs> and that's English from America. And they were looking for somebody who was from America specifically that could read and write English for their American clients. And um, and the other cool thing was that I could stay at home. I could work remotely at home and be with my dog, who was elderly when we brought him there. And ultimately, he passed away almost a year ago. But, um, you know, he, he really needed, I wasn't about to just leave him with somebody else. Because they are like children, they never that never grow up, and um, they're such an important part of our family. There was no way I was going to just, you know, forfeit his his well being just so I could go out and make money. And um, so it, it all just the universe was very kind in that regard. And ultimately, I was able to spend a lot of time with him towards the end of his life and help him through that. That's something we have majorly in common. Yeah, I'm sure. Is I have gin. And, um, tell me, tell me about her. Oh, she's amazing. She has, um, she's d helped me to, you know, do ceremony. Um, I used to, ha um, some friends of mine who were alive, but are now passed, mm -hmm. you know, when they would do lodge and stuff like that, they would let me bring her and she would protect, mm. she would protect once the fire started, all the ceremony started happening, she would protect it and watch it. And then if people were having hard times in the lodge while I was carrying, you know, tending the fire and carrying the stone, she would actually go lay on that part or lean on that part of the lodge to give people support inside. It's like oh. she always knew who needed, you know, something extra. I have a picture of her yeah. laying in front of the doorway of the lodge, the one lodge with uh, my friend Nathan Standing Bear. And there's this ray of light coming down out of the sky through her into the lodge. Wow. Yeah, so she um, is the same thing. We're inseparable. I One time three years ago, I had to go get my certification for um, animal chiropractic. Um, and mm. the whole time I was gone, um, she didn't eat. And she was with a really good friend of mine that, like, just bathes her with love and makes her the princess on a pedestal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after that, it was like, if I, if I, my dog can't go, I don't go. And right. that's just how it is. And we're, we're together. And she's 11. And she came from, I was doing an urban farm build for some people in kind of a rougher area of Sparks, which is next to Reno. Mm -hmm. And the people across the street um, were not only meth addicts, but uh, oh, they God. also were making it. Whoa. And they had gotten her as a puppy. They had small children, too. The police mm -hmm. and sheriffs were always over there, you know, at all times of the night. And um, I periodically would jump over the fence in the front yard. There was nothing in there. It was just dirt. So during the day, she was left outside with, like, no shade and dirt. Oh, man. And no water. She would eat the garbage. She would literally have to get into the garbage bags, you know, to eat the garbage. And then um, 
you know, I watched her for three months from across the street and I'd go by and throw food in there and Mm -hmm. um, when they weren't looking. And then there was just this moment where it was a short fence in the front and she was about five months old and I was watching her over there pacing. And then it was like this moment in her mind where there's got to be a better world (laughs) outside (laughs) this fence. And she totally jumps the fence and um, starts running down a 25 mile an hour road. Uh-oh. This huge Escalade is doing like 50 miles an hour, doesn't even notice her. She turns her face, it clips her head and uh-huh. doesn't do any damage, but knocks her onto the road. Mm-hmm. And then that was it. I went over and I, I picked her up and um, put her back into her yard and just told her, you know, wait till tonight. I'm going to come back tonight. Um, and I got some of the neighborhood people involved. And um, I, they all gave me money, and we went over there and bought her. For, yeah. We're like, you know that you want drugs? You need drugs? And um, so here's some money, and, and give me the dog. Oh. You know, and they were hesitant. <laughs> there was, like, all these neighbors going, just give her the dog. <laughs> yeah. Because they were all concerned because she was just this amazing. Everybody noticed her. Yeah. Because she just had that kind of, you know, power and light. So she's mm. been with me, so I had to get her off drugs. She was addicted to meth because in the house at night, you know, they, they were, were making- giving her meth or no, just the it, by making smoke? it by making oh, yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. The windows and the wall. So oh my she God. was cuckoo for two months at certain periods of the day, um, right. mostly nine o'clock at night. She went so bat poop nuts. I mean, we literally would have to shut all the doors in the house and barricade her in one room in the corner because she just would. She just went to Looney Tunes. But so she's 11 now. She'll be 11 in December. Wow. And um, she's just, you know, I, I tell people I made a contract with her. I told her mm-hmm. we're on the road a lot. We're going to be going to different places, but we're going to be farming. We're going to go in the mountains. We're going to do all kinds of stuff. Stuff's going to be tough sometimes. <laughs> and if you're into that, then I will take care of you. I will be contracted to you and, and, and do the best I can with giving you the best life. Nice. And now that she's aging, you know, we go to the river more because it's easier for her to like swim around um, mm-hmm. instead of on trails and stuff like that. But yeah, so, but she is the, mm-hmm. like you were talking about your dog. I would never abandon her for any reason at all. Well, that's kind of how they feel. We, they don't express it to us, but there's been studies done, you know, where they videotape the dog when the owner goes out and even if it's just out for a few hours, they get stressed out. And you won't know that because um, <laughs> because you're not there uh, unless you have a camera on them. And even then, you know, y- y- a camera doesn't really give you an understanding how they're feeling um, because they, they really are very much a loving entity. And um, it's one of the reasons they're so happy to see you when you get back. It's not just because they love you, but because it's a relief. They're not, they're not worried they know you're going to help them take care yeah. of them. And, and so that's part of what they're, that they're showing their appreciation that you're back. Well, in their, and also in their mindset, they have a gene gene towards, you know, pack. Mm-hmm. And if one goes, they all go. I mean, they may yeah. have their different position in, in the, in the organization, but right. for the most part, if one goes out, they all go out together. Yeah. And they all work together and they learn how to work together. And so I, I find that the older she gets, you know, the more in sync we are mm. because we're together so much. It's like I don't have she doesn't have to train me anymore. Mm-hmm. You, know? <laughs> you know, I'm in yeah. sync and um and it just it works. You know, she can just look at me and 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 uh, you know, I can respond like if we're hearing something or something's going down and we look at each other like we know mm-hmm. exactly, you know, how we're going to handle the situation together. Well, yeah, you guys are family. Mhm. Yeah. You know, and it's and hard to explain that to people. But you well, get it because the native, you know, my native teachers consider everything around them family. Yes. Yeah, I know. And it's it's not a big shift, although once you cross that line, it, it feels like a big shift. I mean, the, the, I'm talking about the perspective, so-called civilization, as we, as we know it, Western civilization, is extremely limited in its understanding. And yet it, it, it's also very uh, arrogant in, in thinking that it somehow is the pinnacle of all creation or civilizations that ever came 
before it. And that's that's kind of a problem, but it's it's because only because they're of the mindset that somehow that they are um they're giving themselves permission basically to to commit cruel acts to others you know and it's it's a very it's a slippery slope i like i said it's unsustainable i i'm totally against uh, commercial farming with uh, animals um cuz it's unnecessary we're finding that out and it's it's just very cruel i understand that a lot of people think that it's okay because they're just dumb animals but um i don't feel that way at all and ultimately when as people evolve and we do become civilized we're not going to we're not going to conduct ourselves in this manner there won't be wholesale slaughter of 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 you know other yeah. species including ourselves yeah and you know that human trafficking and all that kind of stuff that's yeah. going on is wholesale human meat essentially yeah 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 so it's I, okay again though it, it, the thing is we're not victims of the dark side we are participants exactly you know in that regard and and as long as we see ourselves as victims we have um kind of locked ourselves into that and no nothing is going to get us out of it until we decide wait a minute i don't want to be a victim anymore i want to be a survivor and and there's a huge difference between those two perspectives yeah right yeah and so because one is about un- being unempowered and power powerless the other one's all about taking responsibility for yourself and others and and being completely empowered to to make decisions yeah. yeah. I mean, so, you know, um, I always tell people because I've been kind of in the farming end of it, right? Steiner mm-hmm. and biodynamics and mm-hmm. we treat everything with the highest respect um, and make sure that they have the perfect life, you know, the perfect sustainable life that everything needs, right? Working together as a one complete organ, you know, mm-hmm. organism. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was traveling across the U S I ended up in 2014 had to go across Kansas and it's the first time that I'd ever seen a feedlot in person. Oh wow! And uh, you can smell them for like 20 miles yeah. um, because it's so rancid. And, you know, I think that people that live in those areas are so kind of accustomed and used to it. But when you come out from an area like that, and I've, I, I had seen so many different kinds of documentaries and everything else, but it, it did not prepare me <laughs> at all. <laughs> and so I realized why there are movements of people who go, you know, bat poop nuts, you know, when they see that kind of stuff and they want to raid those farms and, you know, save all the animals like in these crazy yeah. acts at night um, because it's that intense and it's that significant. And it mm. just, it kind of brings you to your knees that, you know, we treat anything that way. Well, yeah, it's it's ultimately we're absorbing all of that in the so-called food that we're yeah. eating. It's it's full of not just chemicals, but there's pain this, and suffering. Yeah, yeah, it's a dissonant energy, and it is highly destructive. That's one of the reasons people get sick so much. It's it's not just like it, in other words, it's, there's an energetic component to the food because we are energetic beings and uh, we absorb that and um, it, it keeps us down a path of darkness ultimately so um, look there, the, as you understand people in, in the tribal way they in the past they would always honor if they were taking the life of a particular other animal four legged they always gave thanks to that particular um, spirit well, the other thing, too, is that they would go the day before and do prayers and ceremony mm-hmm. and offerings. And then the next day when they showed up, the animal that wanted to help them right. that they were going to take the life of would, would be a parent and show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so it, was, it was all based on a, what they call a symbiosis. Even though it looks predatory, there was a level of respect and love that was was going on. I think they call this reciprocity, I think is a better word, uh, you know, where the energy is is cyclic. It's not just being like poured down a drain, endlessly just draining everything. Uh, it's, it's, there's, it, 
it, it's more life sustaining or symbiotic. Yeah. 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 And there's a Cherokee story that I always tell people, but it's kind of a cool story, but the, um, you know, the, the deer and the bear, you know, had made contracts with the tribal people, native people, Mm -hmm. um, indigenous people and, um, to, you know, eat them in times of need. Say for Mm -hmm. example, the, the tribal people had times of drought and they would, you know, need to keep their people alive. And so these animals made, you know, spiritual contracts, um, with them. And then when a lot of the influx of other people started to pour in and just started to murder these animals, the story talks about how the deer and bear went to the creator and the council and just said, look, this is not what we've want to participate in you know we're being murdered and slaughtered and for no mm-hmm. rhyme or reason and and these contracts are not being respected and so the creator said well you figure out what you want you know what do you think could solve the problem you know and so the deer and bear go away they come back and they basically tell the creator that and basically they cursed people mostly mm-hmm. the white people with um rheumatism hmm for taking too much so that and the the whole thought process was that that the um they would just their thought process was it would slow them down so that they couldn't walk anymore towards the animals (laughs) to harm them right (laughs) that's a good one i know and so i tell people a lot that have a lot of physical degenerative pain you know that you should really be looking at if you're taking too much are you taking too much are you giving back enough Mm mm-hmm um, and are you hoarding, you know, hoarding will cause a huge amount of, I think, rheumatism and degenerative pain mm-hmm. because that's kind of like, you know, what that is going to teach us that when we're not in a good way with what's around us, kind of a, a thing. That's kind of how I relate it sure. to people in their physical pain, because then it gives them a, a starting point to realize like, you know, that maybe they should look at some things in their life so they can kind of come clean in an area to help their health. Yeah, it's a holistic process. It isn't just a physical thing. I have mm-hmm. to say it's, a, it's very much emotional, spiritual yeah. side to it as well, which I it's sorely lacking in politics in this world. But since I brought that up, um, as I'm reading Return of the Bird Tribes again, and full, really appreciating the messages and the work that's being done behind the scenes on our behalf. I was reminded that the U.S. Constitution was in part based on the League of Nations that, uh, or the tribes, the unification of the tribes through the Iroquois and others, and that they were, um, that they, those tribes were inspired by the bird tribe or the angels, whatever you want to call them, extra dimensional beings that are benevolent were guiding us. They guided the the various tribes and then those tribes then ultimately were guiding the newly forming United States. And that's where the constitution came from. Um, It's, it's not um, perfect. It's not perfect but it is a step in the right direction. So in that regard, having been to, you know, 59 countries so far, I would have to say that um, America still has some beacon of light. And it's not by accident that we were given that. It's, it, it's by design. Yeah. Russell Means, um, I forget what year he died in, but he was doing YouTube videos um, the last five years of his life. So I was mm-hmm. like on his email list to get those. Cool. And um, he talked a lot about that. And he had kind of a a, a law school for his people. I mean, mm-hmm. not law school, but to educate them in law. And he said yeah. that that basically the Constitution is Lakota law. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it, it is inspired and it is, you know, their, you know, what they would adhere to. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't just Lakota. It was it was a group, mm-hmm. of, yeah. and it was yeah. It's all there in the bird uh, return of the bird tribes. Now, obviously, that's interpretation, but it, I do feel a lot of that is true or accurate, and um, it's something worth 
just mentioning because, you know, with the insanity that's going on right now, uh, not just here in this particular country, but around the world, um, w w I think it's important that we look at a better way of governance or life in general. And that's why those those three books, free those three free children's books that I have up on my website at unicusmagazine.com are a very important benevolent divine template of what life is like on civilized worlds. I think we need to look at that and decide if if <laughs> if that's the path we want to go down, then we need to make that choice. And if we do individually make that choice, I think collectively at some point it could happen. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm all in on that. So mm -hmm. um, I put all my time and energy like you do, you know, on the good side, trying to get things changed around mm -hmm. um, so that it's beneficial for all, including the trees and the grasses and the insects and the people, <laughs> all. <laughs> we want to make it beneficial for all. Well, one of the things that I've come to be aware of recently is that um, um, social media, obviously, is not social at all. It's become actually quite anti-social. I, and I also feel that it's really, um, it's far too intellectual. People, uh, including myself, were just chasing shadows on the wall. And um, that's one of the reasons that I decided not to do so much radio. And actually just go out and do real things. Actually have ex more experiential, uh, you know, moments. Because it, it's part of the, the, the greater gift is being in the now. And unfortunately, we talk so much about events that have happened it, that it, it as right now because of the digital media, you know, people are just so fascinated with it. They, you know, they're absorbed into it and are missing the gift of being present, you know, in the now. So, I mean, as much as I love communicating with people, um, I think it's, I'm starting to feel though that it's a huge distraction. And uh, so, you know, that's just, it was kind of a thing that hit me, like, recently, um, pulling away from social, not just social media, but actually hosting a radio show two days a week, um, as well as doing interviews like this, it's just something that um, huh, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot less of that. Yeah, a lot of people, I think, are going through that process. Um, I think I've gone through that process and then kind of a balanced it out with everything else, Good. you know, kind of moved through it. But I think that there's a period where you have to, you know, pull yourself out of it and get rest and kind of recalibrate and kind of focus in, in the energy, you know, that you want to spend time in. Um, and that, that's really helpful. Um, the, uh, I try to stay out of a lot of, uh, you know, one of the good things that I've learned um, from some of my Native teachers is, uh, especially the last one, Bavado, who passed in uh, 2016, um, is, you know, um, trying to live in the now, but that means living in balance with everything. And that if, and, and not going one way or the other, you know, kind of, because that creates kind of imbalance, but try to stay where you are and see how to balance everything out mm -hmm. with, without going from one extreme to the other. But see, that's that, my problem that with a, anti, the social media does that to us. If we tune in, like I used to listen to a lot of talk radio shows, not just yeah. do them, but I would listen during the day. And it's, it's a huge distraction. Mm -hmm. Like It yeah. doesn't allow me to be present because I'm constantly caught up in other people's thought process right yeah i just kind of look at it a little bit differently now okay is that if i do you know listen to what other people are saying i just don't get triggered <laughs> right i don't i uh -huh. just stay out of the triggering part and i 
you know, because I, I do have a lot of people on my show that I, I think are really interesting that, you know, do have some amazing things to say and I don't really agree <laughs> with them. But if I can be in balance, you know what I mean? Try to be in as much balance as I can, then, then I can have them on my show, you know, and they can and present, you know, their side or their beliefs or whatever else that I think mm-hmm. are essential, important. Because I do, I do really feel like everybody's kind of in a different spot, you know, everybody's kind of a kind of in a different process of unraveling. I hate the word awakening, but um, you know, and and I think that there are still, you know, um, people that are making the turn that people like us make a huge difference for. Um, and a lot of it is because, you know, our information may be a little bit more contrary to what, you know, the mainstream or even the awake conscious movements are. Yeah, I understand. Is the, the thing, though, that the distinction I'm trying to make here is that um, most of what we're doing right now is, is just intellectual. Yeah. You know, it's it's impossible to have a spiritual experience when you're just sitting there and listening to the radio, I think. I mean, I've never had it happen like that. It's mostly just, you know, it, it, it just chatter. And mm-hmm. it, it's very distracting because, you know, um, especially these days, everything is so polarized that um, it can make you, if you let it, it can make you feel very confused or, or even, you know, uh, angry. And um, I understand you can you can distance yourself from it in the sense that you're not triggered by it. But then, and then I would say, well, then why are you even listening to that when you could be communing with nature or even communicating with another human being face to face? Because I don't think it's really about the quantity of people that you connect with; it's the quality. Yeah. Well, for me in my world, um, I get a lot of time outside. I mean, Mm -hmm. every day there's a huge amount of time because I'm collecting medicines. You know, this time of year is the time to collect them. And some medicines I won't be able to collect again until next year this time. Mm. So I have to get out there and get them collected. So I have, you know, my medicines for the winter and for my clients and, you know, whatever else um, that I'm going to have. But I don't really talk to people in the outside environments. Hmm. You know, I end up talking more to nature because people in my area are not very conscious. And so I will do things like take boxes of food to the people down, you know, by the river. If I'm going to certain areas where I'm going to collect medicine off the river Mm -hmm. and there's like huge amounts of homeless people, you know, I'll interact with people that way, kind of more in a, you know, a giving way. Like here's a box of food, you know, um, see you again in three weeks, you know, when I come back over this way, or is there any things specifically that you need? Um, And usually, you know, some of the more conscious people are the homeless people, um, but Mm -hmm. I don't interact in a huge way because a lot of them are still terrified, you know, their position living under bridges is kind of terrifying. Um, But I don't really interact with the public in my area very much. Mm. Because they are, I hate the word, you know, they're not very conscious, but they're not, um, it's better for me not to interact with them. Hmm. Um, when you say there's a huge number of homeless, do you mean it, the numbers are growing? Oh, exponentially. And Reno, uh, New York Times posted an article last year in April that Reno had the highest population of homeless per capita in the nation. Why and we're is only that? because of all the fires in California. It's oh, too expensive wow. in California. People they they can't sell their land because yes. you know like the Sonoma fires are still under investigation. So right. they have no place to live. They can't even put a little pull trailer or their car on their own land and sleep oh in it. God. And a lot of cases their their businesses burned down that they worked for. Right. So there's no possible way. And there's so many homeless that are parked everywhere in cars and vans and they keep rousting these encampments and keep them moving that Mm -hmm. um, the communities in these areas, you know, sit down and have these community things about talking to the people financially about leaving the area and where different places that they can go where they might be able to get work in their field, you know, where the income is lower 
Um, and so a lot of people are fleeing, you know, over to Reno from California. Wow. Um, and we have tons of RVs with California plates all over the streets. People mm -hmm. like literally live in the RVs, pushing carts. Wow. Um, yeah, no, it's, and periodically you see, um, so these are not just homeless people. These are economic refugees. They are. No, they're totally, and basically, they're immigrants. They're California immigrants <laughs> to Nevada, right? Um, um, if yeah, you I think about. they call them, yeah, migrant. They're migrants, not, yeah, yeah. Migrants, yeah. Well, yeah. that's typical, you know, throughout history. People do have to migrate because of conditions, changing conditions. Yeah to warfare or climate or whatever. But people would have been more prepared for that. You know, they would have had seed supplies. Oh, yeah. They would have had things and tools, you know, and they would have had trades where, you know, these days, everybody's whole life, you know, especially if they had a mortgage on a house and they were yes. living in it for 20 years, yes. everything was in that, they're, all their eggs were in one basket. Mm -hmm. And wow. so they leave with nothing, you know, they have nothing. And the other part is that, you know, obviously the harassment by the, you know, the, the way that the cities and states deal with it is mm -hmm. like, if they can get rid of them, like, you know, build wealthier towers and, and social, you know, wealthier areas in the areas where they inhabit, then they'll just go away. And that's mm -hmm. not gonna, it's not going to, it's not going to happen because the homeless populations are escalating and, um, you can't hide them anymore. And I really feel, you know, homeless are kind of like a big deal for me. And I think a lot of it is because, you know, like I live in my car, right? I've been doing mm -hmm. this for 2006, but I, I do work a lot. I do um, just not a lot of it is paid, um, participate, you know, um, and I don't really consider myself homeless, homeless, you know, like I don't consider myself in the same situation as somebody else that might be living in their car. And I think it's funny because sometimes I forget, Mm. You know, I'll do something and I'll be like, dummy, 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 you're in the same situation as them. Like, yeah. you, know, you just gave them something you need and you're like, I know, but they needed it more. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, since you bring it up, let me help you. Because uh, yeah. I think a lot of other people are worried about this. I, I'm very yeah, concerned, yeah, yeah, about, yeah. concerned about it too. But because um, and actually we've been moving a lot. And my wife kind of brings jokingly says, "Oh, we're homeless. No, um, we just we don't own a home. We're living. We're renting in different places." The, the, here's the bottom bottom line for me: um, the universe is our home. It's just, this is our birthright. We all live here together. We're all family. No matter where we are, we are home. That's it's just the way it is. And the thing is, the perspective has got to shift. In that regard, um, that's part of the thing in those books, the AMI or the AMI books, is that um, the whole concept of government or countries or borders and all that stuff is artificially imposed, and it actually is a disservice. It it uh, divides us all rather than unites us, and um, that is an uncivilized way of living. So, again, it's unsustainable, and at some point it will collapse. It has to. Yep, I agree. And, um, all I do is I get up every day and I just focus in on, um, you know, the day. Mm -hmm. And um, because I have no idea when it'll change, and I tell people, like, you know, I might not live long enough to see a complete change, you know, mm -hmm. Um Things may get rockier, a lot rockier before they stabilize. Um, like, we just don't know. But what you can do is just focus in on the present moment. And one of the things that I've been working on lately, something that, you know, the last year that comes to mind all the time is, um, do I want to be doing that? You know, say, for example, the planet is going, you know, a lot of people scientifically and in the chemtrail movement say that, you know, we've got like about five years left with trees and in all kinds of stuff. Like we're at the end of the road. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, you know, if we're only going to have five years left, you know, how do I want to spend my time? Mm -hmm. And my time is in nature because that would be the memories that I want to take wherever I go with, 
you know, I want to have that memory in my mind about how beautiful trees are, or how beautiful water is, or how beautiful rocks are, or, or these kinds of things in my memory field. So that way, if I do go some other place, you know, and they're higher of all beings, they can reach into me and they can see these images of what was magnificent about this planet. Well, you're all, but you see, you're also bringing more resonance to the world by being kind and loving to, let's say, your dog and your fellow man. You know, yeah. you help those other people that are so-called homeless, even though, as again, technically nobody is homeless. That's just another misperception. It's a lie, basically, that we're living. Um, look, here's, the, here's the other thing. People ask, how do I defend myself against the dark side? Um, it's not a fight. It isn't a fight at all. But it, the best way, the easiest way, to increase your resonance. I know you I say love, but that's not that's not a really good definition. It's not really clear. So here's what I suggest. Be calm when others are acting crazy, especially be kind when others are being cruel. Be creative when others are being destructive and ultimately be courageous when others are afraid. And so so kind, you know, excuse me, calm, kind, creative and courageous. The, the reason I bring those up is because that's, those are all resonant things that you can do. And the activities, more importantly, it's a it's a decision. It's a choice. The more of that that you do every day in your life, the more resonant energy that you will actually embody, and it will over time become infectious with others that are near you and interacting with you. And in that regard, we can actually rise, raise the tide of resonance or love, however you want to look at it, the oneness, um, peacefully for everybody. You know, it starts with individuals, but the more of us that do this collectively, ultimately, it, it does make a huge shift. Yeah, definitely the key word is choose to live. Mm-hmm choose to live and ralph ring i don't know if you know who he oh, is yes mm -hmm. he's they're friends of mine and they were on my oh, show really? yeah they were on my show a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about i love ralph when i get him really going he'll yeah. talk about some really amazing things mm -hmm. and um we we're talking about victor schellenberger because we both really mm -hmm. love victor schellenberger and he was talking about explaining to people how you know victor schellenberger figured out that fish are designed um, to be swam that the water propels them mm -hmm. and, and swims them they don't swim they're swammed <laughs> and then <laughs> we talked about same with birds you know they're not flying they're flown you know they they have the the relationship to the forces of air and so they're designed that way mm -hmm. and so at the end of the show he like you know dropped a big language bomb and he said so we have to be lived we're not living we're we should be lived, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, kind of like all the forces around us, living us, you know what I mean? Guiding us, propelling us, you know, taking us where we need to go and having the experience that are necessary. What we're designed for is to be lived instead of living. Okay. Well, since you brought that up, I was saying before the break um, that, uh, we're all yeah this will be great yeah we're, we're all connected to a web of light that's part of the fabric of creation it's like you could say sort of like streams turn to rivers turn to oceans okay so when i say a web of light it's organic it's part of the fabric and um now the thing about it's not just light it's information it's life the life force flows like a web of uh, tributaries that are all connected and we can connect i mean we're we were born connected the problem is over time especially here in this world as it currently exists we disconnect we are encouraged to by the dark side to disconnect ourselves from the web of light and that is it, that diminishes us greatly so that's why i was suggesting before to be calm and kind creative and courageous because as we increase our resonance it increases our ability to connect to the web of light it 
the other thing is disconnecting from digital media because unfortunately although it can be used for good ultimately the the bad side is that it 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 prevents us from connecting fully to this web of light that i'm describing it was shown to me um during one of my contacts with the benevolent extraterrestrials our extended family and it is um it's that is the force that they talk about in star wars and you don't have to be a jedi you don't have to be engaged in a conflict you just have to know that it exists and that we can connect to it whenever we choose to do so it's not impossible it is difficult when you first start doing it like anything else but we're designed to do this and um to have that um extended capability like look if you if you see a spider when it spins a web it feels everything every breeze everything that touches that web is you know the spider feels it and so when we connect to this web of light we can literally feel and know everything that's going on throughout all of creation it's a bit overwhelming when you first start doing it but eventually you become like you were talking about the fish and the birds it becomes a very much a natural part of who you, and what you are how you were designed yeah that's part of our design yeah and that's why i brought it up because it's largely overlooked some people know that are aware um, but most people I find that have no idea that this is this is part of reality and that you know we have the ability to tap into it. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um we have about um anyway, your um conversation has been really good for a lot of people. I've been getting a lot of Skype messages and I've got some people um Facebooking me. So that's good. You're okay. um you're hitting a you're hitting a home run. <laughs> um I'm so just we trying to help people find their way home. Yeah, but hitting a home run is okay too. Yeah, it's fine. Sure. Um okay, so we have about uh ten minutes left uh -huh. of, of the two hours and it goes by so fast it does and so glad that you came on and um got a well, chance to get to know you and um, yeah. actually have a conversation with you and actually this conversation is, is a lot better than the one that i listened to briefly the one that you were on um <laughs> so uh well you know i am um, i just uh you get to try to get to the heart of who people are and sure. see if we get to express that and meet um, meet that way. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. Is there anything, you know, we didn't talk about that you would really want to talk about or something you want to drive home? Also tell us about your website again before, um, before you start talking about what you want to close with. Sure. The website is unicusmagazine.com. That's all one word. U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. Um, everything that all my work is posted there. Actually, it's not just my work. There's, <laughs> I promote other people's work that I feel is extremely important to our ongoing healing, the healing process that's, that's happening. Kind of hard to, you would probably not notice that if you just look at mainstream media or some of these other sites that have become very popular on the internet. Um, they're very much focused on the problem. I am focused on the answer as much as, humanly possible and um yeah that's that's what i'm working on it's 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 a day-by-day -day thing you know because i'm learning i'm growing i'm healing myself and um you know as i said it's a privilege and a pleasure to be of service that's why i do this and um i i really am very optimistic despite the difficulties that we are facing Currently, um, I know that all that can be overcome in a very short period of time. And ultimately, this world can be um, revitalized and all life can live in peace and harmony and prosperity. It can be done. And, you know, for, if for some reason it doesn't happen now and the whole system collapses, it, the potential will always be there. And this is true for all worlds, not just this one. Just want to make that very clear. Um, 
uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know. It's a, <laughs> it doesn't get much bigger than that. I, I'm a very much a big person, big picture kind of person. And I, but I also know it's very holistic. And, uh, so I try, I try and be very inclusive and leave any kind of divisive stuff out of it. That's why I'm, you know, politics and religion and that kind of stuff is, is just to me is not the answer. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree on okay. all of it. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so there, I'll, I'll just tell you this quick story. It was a Go pivotal ahead. part of my life. Um, it's a super good story. Um, I was at Rudolf Steiner College, you know, going through the biodynamic program. And also, so I was taking a whole bunch of other courses too. And I took this course that I highly recommend to people. It's called Phenomenology. And Um, probably I'm going to be teaching some mini phenomenology courses. I got to get my website all straightened out before I can put that out so that people can, um, come to the zoom meetings and actually kind of take some, some of these kinds of samples of awareness. A lot of it has to do with nature Mm -hmm. and looking at nature and the, and, and just paying more attention to it and, and really looking at it. But anyway, so there was this leaf class. It was probably the probably one of the most mind blowing things that ever hammered me, you know, hammered me awake um, into dealing with the environment. I was already involved with the environment a lot and really wanting to help it and farming and lots of other stuff, but this really changed everything. This is the game changer. So I was taking these classes and we got to this class, the leaf class in phenomenology at Rudolf Steiner college and Rudolf Steiner college is now closed. Mm-hmm. Um, which is sad because it was a gem, a gem. And um, we go through the whole class for eight hours. We're studying leaves. We're sharing leaves. We're working with leaves together in groups, putting leaves on the windows, looking at the light coming through the leaves, mm-hmm. you know, dropping them off ladders, seeing how they deal with wind, <laughs> you know, using the right and left hemisphere, yeah. drawing them to like kind of more of a goth kind of way of studying spiritual science, right? Mm -hmm. To come up with your own conclusions. And so you have conclusions in the group and then the teacher really tries to lead you into the information so that you can unravel yourself. Well, at the end of this class, she gives us this ditto sheet and it's basically the microscopic, you know, layers of the leaf. You know, it looks like a lasagna once it's all breaking down. Something you can't see by just looking at a leaf. But it has multiple layers in it. And you were like, oh yeah, thanks for the ditto sheet. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Blah 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 blah. And then she comes around and she gives us this other ditto sheet that's not labeled. And it has the lasagna and the description of the the layers of the parts of the leaf. And and she's asking us, you know, what do we notice most? And it's like, well, the untitled ditto sheet looks almost exactly the same as the leaf you know in the way that the leaf is layered and the photosynthesis blah 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 blah. and um, it turns out that after we were done discussing this other ditto sheet that was untitled um, she told us it was a rabbit retina so the rabbit retina sees exactly like a leaf Hmm. A leaf during photosynthesis and light can see you as good as a rabbit retina could see you. And that, I literally went home, I cried hysterically because I had to drive back and forth for school for a year, over a year. Um, and I literally cried hysterically for three hours. It just, it so changed everything that I never wanted to take my stress out into nature anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. And, and have anxiety, but to like be able to walk up to a tree and go, can you see me? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> well, the, the thing I remind people of in Western culture is all the trees are family. They're all connected. They have a communication system. So we think we're advanced because we've got the internet. <laughs> the trees have had that since the very beginning of their creation. And, and like I said, beyond that, there's a web that connects everything throughout all of creation anyway. Science calls it entanglement or whatever, but it's just it it's just a part of reality. And it's important when we recognize that. Because when we do, it recognizes us and then the feedback mechanism starts kicking in, you know, and it's <laughs> the trees need us. 
We need the trees. We need each other. We need to work together in order to be happy and healthy and whole. And and it's just it it sounds overly simplistic, but it it's it isn't. It's really complex, but it's also sustainable. And that's I know that you that word's used a lot, but it's it's the only way forward uh, for us if we want to survive in this format. You know, the other thing is when you look at physical stuff. Since you brought that up, if you really break it down, it's just energy patterns. That doesn't make it trivial by any means, okay? It's still important. But the, the fact of the matter is that physical objects are not physical at all. They're just energy patterns that are interacting, intersecting. Um, they're called interference patterns because when they combine, they're either working together or against each other. The scientific word for this is called cymatics. C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, I believe. And it's, um, it's a studying of uh, energy patterning. And basically all this, what we think of as the platonic solids, they're not solid at all. They are energy patterns. So here's why this is important. is because everything is this. I mean, as, as far as manifestation, but it comes from a non-physical place. And here's how it works. There's consciousness is waveforms. You lower the frequency a little bit, and it would be now what we consider energy. You lower the frequency even more, and it becomes matter. Specifically, when those frequencies start to interact, when those waves start to interact with one another, they, they form these crystalline patterns that we recognize and call matter. But it's hey, all the same thing. Yes. Hey, I think we're in promos right now okay. because the show's ended. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really appreciative that you came on and uh, maybe, you know, when you want to come back into the radio scene, shoot me an email and come back okay. on. Um, our good. listeners really liked you today. And um, okay. so that's a really good thing. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. And maybe we can go into that whole wave thing again next time that you come on. <laughs> okay. Sounds good, Bridget. Take care. Thank you so much. Have a great well, day. All right. You too. Bye. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome to Revolution Radio, where you, the listeners, are in charge. Here at Revolution Radio, we present 48 broadcast hours of news and information each and every day. Revolution Radio never sleeps. Revolution Radio is worldwide and borderless information. Revolution Radio is also commercial free. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, the listeners. And that's why we appeal to you to donate and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selections, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio's swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store, which you can get T-shirts, coffee cups, even a baby onesie. Or you can just plain donate to the cause. We cannot continue without your support, and your support is what helps pay the bills. So please, if you wish us to continue, please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? 
and survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a megavirus or a computer failure took out your bank or all the banks